Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for um, reading out all the names for me. Um, I'm here today to talk about two papers here. Uh, so first of all, thanks for uh, the authors of the first paper here uh, uh, for letting me present today. Uh, but without much ado, let me just get started. Uh, this talk is going to be about concurrent secured computation. So let's just briefly recall once again what secured computation is. There's two parties. Um, who, uh, Alice and Bob, let's say, who have X and Y, and they would like to compute uh, F of X and Y uh, through a protocol. And uh, the goal of security here is that if you corrupt any one party, he learns nothing more than the output of the protocol. Okay. Uh, this is a very well-studied notion um, from 1982. Um, and the security guarantees that we <coughs> began studying were uh, guarantees when we said well, there's only one thing in this world. We run this protocol pi, and we ask, is this protocol secure? Okay. On the other hand, today, things are very different. There is like so many different things happening. Uh, right now, while I'm giving this talk, I'm doing a lot of other things. Uh, um, and then we would like to have security for everything put together. Okay? Um, so for instance, uh, an adversary who corrupts some subset of parties that we are interacting with as a single person and running a bunch of protocols with, um, could run very many correlated attacks on a bunch of these protocols. And we'd like to guarantee security even in this concurrent setting. Um, this uh, naturally asks the following question that, that has been well studied as well, which is, can we design protocols that remain secure even when executed in this concurrent uh, setting of today? Uh, the sad news that we had from long time ago is that, uh, uh, actually, uh, happy sad news, which is that this area is interesting to study because things that we know about standalone secure protocols is, uh, uh, does not imply security for um, concurrent security. Okay. Um, well, uh, so then uh, what do we know about this uh, concurrent security? What are uh, some good things about it? Well, if you make uh, global trust assumptions, like uh, the common random string, uh, then we know that uh, general positive results are known for concurrent um, security for a very, uh, large, uh, I mean, in fact, for um, some of the strongest notions of security, like the UC security. Alternatively, one can relax the security definition to talk about um, a concept called bounded concurrency or super polynomial time simulation, in which case we know uh, that, again, there are positive results for a bunch of functionalities. On the other hand, in the very uh, simple plain model, uh, we do not know uh, a generic positive result. And this is quite intriguing that, you know, uh, because on the contrary, for standalone computation, we do know positive results uh, in the plane model. Okay. So maybe uh, what about negative results, right? Uh, broad impossibility results uh, are actually known in the plane model, but for very strong notions of concurrency, again, like UC. Uh, however, uh, this still leaves um, some important gaps in our understanding of uh, what concurrency is. Do we really need to have um, only two levels of concurrency, the one that is uh, standalone or like uh, one that is UC? Maybe there's something in between, and what about, what about our understanding of those? Okay. Um, this um, motivated um, uh, the first paper, the authors from the first paper, to consider the following setting of concurrency. Okay. Um, think about a scenario where there's a bunch of clients and a server. And this is not as complicated as the real world. They're all just running the same protocol with the server. Every single client is running the same protocol pi. Okay. Uh, and the model is even simpler in that we would like to think of either only the clients getting corrupted or the servers getting corrupted. Okay. So there is no like uh, cross corruptions. Even this simple model, uh, but very realistic model, we would like to ask, what are positive results, what are negative results for this uh, setup? It turns out that uh, in this model, uh, we know positive results for concurrent zero knowledge, uh, which is, again, very well studied from 1999. And uh, we have impossibility results for some other functionalities. Okay? However, um, a very simple functionality, like the oblivious transfer functionality, was something that we did not know whether it was possible or not. And this was le left open as uh, late as 2008, uh, very explicitly. And uh, uh, the authors considered this uh, as their motivation to study uh, the notion of fixed roles in concurrency. Um, the other set of authors, um, Garg, Ostrowski, Wisconsin, and myself, uh, we considered the uh, following different problem. 
uh, which is, well, suppose there is a bunch of clients and servers, once again, communicating with each other. Okay. They would like to run the same protocol many times. However, the inputs for all of these protocols are decided a priori, before the protocols even begin. It's not like you run a protocol, then you take something from it, and then uh, make up inputs again. Okay. In this fixed input setting, we are what is possible and what is not possible. In this setting, it was known that uh, impossibility results existed for some very specific functionalities. And so the natural <laughs> question to ask was, what about the rest of the functionalities? Okay. Uh, these two um, seemingly different motivations led um, all of us together to come up with uh, the following uh, core result, which I'll be presenting today, uh, which is that concurrent self-composition is actually impossible for the oblivious transfer functionality, not just in either of these settings, but in both these settings, actually, in both fixed input and fixed role settings. And both papers um, sort of presented this result. Uh, this will be the uh, proof that I'll be presenting today. But before we get there, um, I'd just like to say uh, independent extensions of uh, each of the works. Uh, the first work, uh, they presented um, that concurrent composition is impossible for all non-trivial and uh, symmetric and asymmetric functionalities. Uh, they also stated that another notion of computation, which is called stateless computation, um, was impossible. Um, Agarwal, Goel, Jain, uh, Prabhakaran, and Sahai, they uh, show um, a very interesting non-interactive completeness theorem. Uh, there is completeness theorem known for standalone computation from 2000 by Killian. Uh, it's a very celebrated result. Uh, they showed that um, this result, which used interaction, was uh, actually could be improved, and you could have a non-interactive version of this. And they used this new result that they obtained to show us a corollary that actually concurrent composition was impossible in the uh, fixed input setting for all non-trivial non asymmetric functionalities. So putting these um, extensions apart for now, I'm going to go back to the case of oblivious transfer, which we just uh, uh, is a special case, is going to be impossible. And we're going to uh, study why this is the case. Uh, so that we can see some, uh, some of the technical content of both of our papers. Uh, so just to recall uh, oblivious transfer to guess, the functionality on the left here, um, the ideal world, is basically where Alice has two strings, S0 and S1, and Bob has a bit B. And uh, they both communicate to the ideal functionality, and Bob receives SB. This in particular means that Bob has no idea about S1 minus B, and Alice has no idea about the bit B itself. So in this real world, there is no um, ideal guy. And so Alice and Bob are running a protocol pi. And we would like to have this level of security, which is that these two uh, executions are indistinguishable. Uh, and not only for the standalone setting, but when it's run multiple times, when the same protocol is run multiple times. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an attack on this protocol when this protocol is run concurrently uh, with <coughs> some other protocol uh, in the environment. So let's just study this, this attack, which is known in theory as the chosen protocol attack. Um, so here we have Alice and Bob. Bob is going to be our bad guy uh, today. Uh, what Bob is going to do is uh, he's going to run uh, a sim similar to the OT protocol with Dave. Uh, this is called the chosen protocol. I'm going to change the protocol from pi OT in a bit. Uh, and all that he's going to do is he's going to just uh, forward all the messages that Alice sends to him to Dave, and forward all the messages that Dave sends to him to Alice. Okay? If they were both running Pi OT, Alice and Bob would uh, not rec uh, realize that anything was going wrong, because it would just seem like uh, you know, they're just talking to each other. In this setting, we're going to change the protocol on the right a little bit. And we're going to say that Dave, once the protocol is complete, is going to do the following change. He's going to check if the output that he received from this protocol is actually, we already are going to give him S0 and S1, is actually equal to SB. So he's going to check if this condition is true. And if this condition is true, he's going to send S1 minus B. Okay. So from this, we see that this protocol, this uh, new protocol that we created out of the Pi OT protocol, renders the protocol insecure in some way, um, hopefully, because Bob learns S1 minus B, um, if run concurrently. Now let's look at what happens in the ideal world. In an ideal scenario, where Bob actually talks to some ideal guy, he does not have this advantage of messages that Alice sent him. 
So he could not just you know, replay these messages to Dave. Instead, now Bob is supposed to somehow cook up these messages from these interactions that he has with the ideal, uh, ideal world guy. From these interactions, he could learn one of S0 or S1, okay? but he can never learn both. And in this protocol, Bob could ask for any, uh, Bob could play with some B, which he does not know about. Uh, Bob does, uh, sorry, Dave could play with some B, which Bob does not know about. And therefore, uh, he will succeed in this protocol with probability at most half. Okay? This means that uh, he learns S1 minus B, which is some information that he did not have with probability at most half. So this shows that the real scenario, uh, which happened here, and the ideal scenario, which is happening here, is sort of distinguishable with probability half. So therefore, the protocol pi OT that we replaced by the ideal version of it is no longer secure if it's run concurrently with this chosen protocol here. Okay? Uh, this already shows that composing these two protocols is a bad idea. Now what we would like to do, ideally, is to go from here to a scenario where we go to what, we con what I consider some of the weakest um, models of concurrency, where we have fixed roles, fixed input, and the same protocol being run again and again. So that is the next step, which is we have additional parties here. We introduce a new party, Dave, so we would like to get rid of him. We get rid of him by using um, a technique in, um, that's well known, known as garble circuits. Um, garble circuits basically help us replace any functionality including uh, a reactive functionality like Dave, who is actually reacting to a protocol by just a box or, or some cryptographic mechanism, which you can interact to one time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give um, Bob the garble circuit, we're gonna give Alice the keys for the garble circuit, and Bob is going to interact with this garble circuit instead of Dave. Okay? So there's just one OT protocol that's running right now. Okay? And this is all happening inside Bob's head. And what Bob is actually going to do is he's going to uh, go ahead and in order to obtain these keys for the garble circuit, he's going to start many more OT sessions uh, in between uh, some of the messages of these sessions and execute the garble circuit and uh, be able to replay the attack that we saw earlier. So in this setting now, when we make this transformation, we have that Alice and Bob are basically running a lot of OT protocols. Bob is the only party who is corrupted, therefore this is in the setting of fixed roles. It also turns out that the inputs for the party Alice could be set a priori before any of the computation begins, and therefore um, that would make it in the fixed input setting, and that would be our main impossibility result. Okay. Since I have uh, some more minutes, I think I'm going to start with uh, the complete proof now, okay. uh, because that was just a primer. Actually, I was just kidding. You should just go see the full version, okay? Because unlike uh, uh, most papers, uh, which have zero full versions online, some papers which have one full versions online, our papers, because I'm presenting two papers today, actually has two uh, full versions available, okay? Uh, so thank you. Um, and uh, many thanks also to uh, Abhishek Jain and Shweta Agarwal, uh, who helped me make these slides. So, thanks. Thank you.